title of our sermon this morning is Free or Not Free? That is our question. Free or Not Free? That is our question. Welcome back to our un- ongoing study of the essentials. Uh, our ongoing study of the essentials. One sermon, one hour, one introduction to one foundational subject that we believe to be essential to the growth and maturity of the Christian. Now, we've been considering the doctrine of man together these last several weeks in this series, and we come now this morning to the subject of free will. We come to the subject of free will. Is the will of man free or not free? That is our question. Now, this is what they might call in the South a hot potato. (laughs) <laughs> this is a hot-button issue. You want to trigger an evangelical snowflake, bring up the topic of free will, and they will be thus triggered. <laughs> uh, it is generally confusion regarding this subject that will lead many to an outright denial of other foundational biblical truths. This issue often becomes the stumbling block, the third rail, so to speak, the hill to die on, that prevents professing Christians on both sides of the debate from coming to a knowledge of the truth. In our humanistic, in our man-centered age, this is often the subject that must be understood before many will accept what the Bible says about many other subjects, including the sovereignty of God or the depravity of man. And many, many, many miss the gospel because of confusion around this subject. In answer... To Erasmus and his diatribe on free will, written in 1524, the reformer, Martin Luther, wrote this. Luther said, It is not irreligious, idle, or superfluous, but in the highest degree wholesome and necessary for a Christian to know whether or not his will has anything to do in matters pertaining to salvation. Indeed, let me tell you, this is the hinge on which our discussion turns, the crucial issue between us. Our aim is simply to investigate what ability free will has, in what respect it is, the subject of divine action, and how it stands related to the grace of God. If we know nothing of these things, we shall know nothing whatsoever of Christianity and shall be in worse case than any people on earth." The issue to Luther was the nature of our own ability, the nature of free will, or the extent and limit of what we must do regarding our standing with God, and equally important, or more important, you could say, the nature of God's work in salvation, the extent or the limit of what He does in us. It's an extremely important, it's a critical issue, right? Wrong, unbiblical thoughts about free will pave the broad road to destruction. Is the will of man free or not free? That is our question. Now, in our study of the essentials, through the doctrine of God, through the doctrine of man, we've been confronted with two inarguable, unquestionable, undeniable truths from the Word of God. One God works all things after the counsel of his own will. All things. That's inarguable, unquestionable. The Bible clearly teaches that. He decrees all things whatsoever that come to pass. That which orders the cosmos is not the will of man, but in fact the will of God. Entirely the will of God. He decrees not only the ends, but he decrees the means, even the secondary causes by which his decrees are executed in history according to his providence. Now, people often don't have a problem with that as long as we think of it in terms of the big picture. God, in terms of the big picture, is sovereign over all things. But when it comes to the individual choices of men, that's where we have difficulty, right? They get very uncomfortable when we see the sovereignty of God extending to the actions and decisions and even choices of his creatures. That's the first truth. The second truth we've been confronted with is this. Man, made in the image of God, is a morally responsible free agent. Well, that's true. That's what the Bible teaches. Free and able to make choices. And listen, free and able to make choices that have eternal and lasting significance, right? Right? Choices for which man will be judged, choices for which man will be held responsible, choices for which man will be held accountable before his creator. Now, these two 
very important truths concerning God's sovereignty and man's freedom, God's sovereignty, man's responsibility, are not in any way contradictory. They don't contradict one another. They're not at odds. These two biblical truths are happily married, (laughs) right? And armchair hack theologians are always trying to break up the relationship. (laughs) These two truths are not incompatible. Failing to understand what the Bible teaches will lead to apparent conflict in the marriage when there isn't any conflict in the marriage. Those two things, those two truths are happily married. And many, through their ignorance of the Word of God, through their misunderstanding, their lack of understanding with what the Word of God clearly teaches, create strife, create contention in that happy marriage. When there isn't any strife and contention, there shouldn't be any. Now, one group of professing Christians would ignore, neglect, or reject what the Bible clearly says about God's sovereignty in order to hold to their definition of free will. For them, man is entirely autonomous, self-governing. Man is independent and self Directed. Man is endowed by God with the freedom to do anything and everything that man wants to do, whether good, evil, or indifferent. We live in a cause and effect world, and our free choices aren't effects because our free choices have no cause. They may agree that God is sovereign, but God must limit his sovereignty or the exercise of his sovereignty in order to uphold man's free will. As such, Man's free choices are spontaneous. They're not conditioned or conditional on anything or anyone. He can make choices free of bias, free of influence, free of external conditions, free of dispositions, free of inclinations, free of any inducements. Free will means I choose. It means that my choices are not in any way determined. There may be nothing and no one that leads to or influences my choice. They don't deny the fact of influence or inducements, but that we can choose despite those influences or inducements. If there's any influence or any conditions involved, then I have the power to reject those. And particularly now, with respect to salvation, I choose to be saved. I choose to reject salvation. It is my choice. This view is called libertarianism. It's not the political view, (laughs) not the same thing. This view is libertarianism. By far the most popular view, the most popular theological view, and most often, even in the professing church, most often assumed to be true, libertarianism. Now, of course, they would look to the Bible and say that Scripture supports this view. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, Moses says, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right? Sounds like choice, doesn't it? Or all the whosoever free offers of the gospel. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In particular, John chapter 3, verse 16, seems to speak of, Potentiality, doesn't, doesn't it? A potential salvation based upon a person's free choice. Anyone has the power to believe if they choose to believe. Anybody, anywhere, anytime can choose to believe. The libertarian would say that notions of God decreeing all things whatsoever that come to pass is incompatible with this freedom, incompatible with free will that it undermines human's responsibility for sin, does violence to human free will. Therefore, God exercises his sovereignty, but not in any way that undermines our freedom. God has to restrain or constrict his sovereignty. He must limit himself to uphold human free will. Now, other professing Christians, 
on the other side of the road that drives a straight line through the middle between these two positions, other professing Christians find themselves in the ditch on the other side of the road, ignoring, neglecting, or rejecting what the Bible clearly says about man's free moral agency in order to hold to their division, their de definition of free will. One side neglects God's sovereignty. The other side neglects human free will. For them, all human actions are predetermined. They're not really choices at all. In fact, we only think that we're free. Human freedom, human choice is an illusion. Ultimately, there's no such thing as human freedom. We live in a cause and effect world and God controls all the causes and predetermines or controls all of the effects. And what we choose, we do not really choose ourselves. It's really not up to us. It's already baked into the cake, so to speak. Choice and free will then is an illusion. This is the error of fatalism, of hyper-determinism or hyper-Calvinism. If God wants me saved, he's going to save me and there's nothing that I or anybody else can do anything about it. God asked me to do things I can't do and so he has to make me do them and frankly, he can't hold me accountable if I don't. Remember I was witnessing door-to-door uh, -door in a neighborhood just down the street from the church here and someone said that exact thing to me. Presented the gospel to him and he said, listen, if God wants me saved, he's gonna save me. This is the error that he had fallen into. If he wants me to turn from my sin, then he's going to turn me from my sin. Do you see? Let us eat, drink, and be merry, therefore, for tomorrow we die. <laughs> A more modern take on this old heresy we could call Flip Wilsonism. Flip Wilson, you know who Flip Wilson is, the old comedian? Flip Wilson used to run around saying, the devil made me do it, <laughs> right? The devil made me do it. Just as heretical, <laughs> just as wrong-headed, there's a lot more involved in it than this, isn't there? We don't want to be overly simplistic, but you get the idea, these two ditches on either side of the road. The problem for libertarianism is the Bible. Scripture clearly teaches that God actively works all things after the counsel of his own will, including the salvation of his elect, whom he has chosen to give to the Son before time began, having written their, their names in the Lamb's book of life from before the foundation of the world, those whom he must efficaciously call to himself if they are to be saved. And the problem for the fatalistic hyper-Calvinist is also the Bible. Scripture clearly teaches that man is fully responsible for his free actions, fully responsible for his free choices, that man must choose to turn from sin, and man must choose to turn to Christ to be saved, and that those who turn to him in faith will in no wise be cast out. So here's what the Bible does teach. Here's what the Bible does teach. Every choice that we make is free. And every choice that we make is determined. This view is called compatibilism. Not combatibilism, <laughs> like we're going to battle. These things, are, these things are married. They're not at war with each other. Compatibilism. They're compatible. Every choice that we make is free, and every choice that we make is determined. Determinism doesn't make God a cosmic puppet master and we his puppet slaves. Do you see? Free will doesn't mean that we are entirely free either, does it? Our question, free or not free, just became a little more complex, but it's no more elusive. The answers are in the Bible. We find the answers in the Bible. It's not as simple as one shouting, whosoever will, and then stomping back to his corner. Right? And the other one, shouting, no free will, and then stomping back to his corner. Each one quoting their pet verses or their pet theology. It's not that simple. You have to do the hard work in the Bible. It comes through good exegesis, taking into consideration many texts. The answers are certainly there for the one who will do the hard work. So we want to begin this morning with an introduction to this subject of free will. The view that properly balances God's sovereignty or God's sovereign will with human freedom is called compatibilism. Our confession of faith 
the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, clearly asserts this regarding God's decree. Listen. God hath decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably all things whatsoever that come to pass. How many things? All things, right? Yet so as thereby is God neither the author of sin nor hath fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature. And then, the 1689 defines free will, or the free moral agency of man in this way, in chapter 9, article 1. God hath endued the will of man with that natural liberty and power of acting upon choice. Choice that is neither forced nor by any necessity of nature determined to do good or evil. We have choice, right? Every choice that we make is free, and every choice that we make is determined. That's what you get when you put both of those truths, those biblical truths, together. These truths are not incompatible. These truths are compatible. The Bible clearly teaches both. This is called compatibilism. Now, we've spent some time in prior sermons considering God's sovereignty and the concept of determinism. So we want to spend the remainder of our time together this morning discussing the nature of free will. Now, in order to understand what the Bible clearly teaches regarding the will of man, we'll need to think through three primary subjects. Three subjects, okay? One, man's will after the fall or the effects of the fall. Two, man's will after conversion, the effects of conversion. And three, man's will after glorification, the effects of glorification on the will of man. Man's will after the fall, man's will after conversion, man's will after glorification. To do that, turn to the text read in your hearing earlier, Ephesians chapter 2, and look there beginning with me at uh, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Now something dramatic Something profound happened to man as a result of his fall into sin. We can see it all around us, right? Uh, I think the psychoanalytic term for it is we're a mess, right? We're a mess. Something is profoundly wrong with man. Man was created upright. Man was created innocent. He had the power to do that which was pleasing to God. And the Lord said to Adam, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. We know from Scripture that Adam and Eve, when they took the fruit of that tree, died that day in the garden spiritually. They died spiritually. They would later die physically. And now all those born in Adam, all of us here, are born in Adam. We have Adam as our first father, so to speak. We are born spiritually dead. And that's how Paul describes us here in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And you... He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, right? In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others." Now, prior to the Lord, verse 1, giving sinners new life in Christ, prior to being born again, prior to regeneration, sinners outside of Jesus Christ are described as dead in their sin. Do you see? Dead. Not sick, not feeling ill, not a tickly throat, dead. Do you see? Dead. Dead in their sin. This is not hyperbole. Uh, This is not um, flowery language. This is Paul making a specific point about the condition of fallen man. They are dead in their sin. A dead man can't do much, can he? Right? He's dead. This is the Bible's diagnosis of fallen man. We didn't sneak in the Bible last night and write that there for you. Uh, This is Paul's diagnosis, the Lord's diagnosis of fallen man. In sin, our mothers conceived us. We are brought forth in iniquity. We are dead on arrival, dead in trespasses and sins. Now, notice Paul isn't speaking here of physically dead. He's writing to people who are breathing, right? 
Paul is speaking here of spiritual death. You are, you were, prior to Christ, spiritually dead in sin. Now, what does being spiritually dead in sin look like? What does it look like? How does he describe their wretched condition? Well, dead in sin, verse 2, looks like walking according to the course of this world. Walking according to the course of this world. Dead in sin, verse 2, looks like walking according to Satan, the spirit who works in those born to sin. Right? Dead in sin, verse 3, looks like walking according to the flesh. What is Paul describing here? He's describing our outward conduct. This is how those who are dead in sin live. This is how we conduct ourselves. This is how we act. If you're dead in sin, this is the Bible's diagnosis of your condition. Now, did you notice there, verses 2 and 3, our three enemies. What are the three enemies of the Christian? The world, the flesh, and the devil. We have, in verses 2 and 3, our three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil are three very powerful influences on our choices. Very powerful influences on our choices. Listen, we don't choose anything in a vacuum. You don't make choices free of influence, free of prejudice, free of bias, free of conditions, free of inducements. We don't make choices that way. Our choices are made based upon conditions. Our choices are not free of influences in that sense. We do make choices, but our choices have causes. Now think with me for a moment about that fact. You woke up, you came to church this morning, uh, you got up, you got dressed, and you chose something to wear. Some of you, I'm not sure why you made that choice, but you made it nonetheless. I'm joking. (laughs) You made it nonetheless. You made the choice to wear what you wear and get in your car and come to church this morning. That wasn't made in a vacuum. You're making that choice. It may be the temperature outside that had something to do with that. It may be the fact that nothing else was ironed. It may have, right? There are any number of reasons why you would make that choice. When you came into the church today, you came through the back doors. You walked into the auditorium and you chose somewhere to sit. That choice where you're sitting right now is not made in a vacuum. There are reasons. There are influences, inducements for why you chose to sit where you're... Probably because Papa Lewis took you by the hand and put you in that seat. And your lack of choice was his choice of where you're going to sit today, right? So, in other words, we don't make choices free of influence. We don't make choices free of determinations or conditions, Now notice in verse 2, two of those are external influences on us. What are those? The world and the devil. External influences on our choices. And listen, those are powerful external influences. But notice the third is internal. One of those is an extraordinarily, you could say the most powerful influence influence on our choices. It's an internal influence. Notice how how Paul speaks of the flesh now in verse 3. Look at verse 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Now think with me for a moment about these two verses, okay? Conduct refers to the free choices that we make. Paul begins by speaking of our conduct. In this case, we choose to conduct ourselves in sin. The one who is dead in trespasses and sins is the one who is conducting himself in sin, right? Choosing, making choices about living in sin. We are dead in sin, and so we choose to sin. Do you see? But notice how Paul then begins to peel back the layers of the onion. Our conduct are the free choices that we make. But what are those free choices doing? Verse 2. They are fulfilling what? The lusts of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the mind. Those choices are fulfilling our desires. Do you see? We make choices according to our desires, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the mind. 
Man desires to fulfill the lusts of the flesh, and so man freely chooses sexual immorality. Right? Man freely chooses those sins which fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Man desires to fulfill the, or desires to fulfill the desires of his mind, and so he freely chooses to carry out sinful schemes, sinful plots. The will does not act independent of desire. The will does not act independent of the mind. In that sense, our will isn't free, is it? Our will is not free in that sense, is it? We make choices based upon our desires. We make choices based upon the mind, our decisions. We're influenced, driven, motivated, compelled, constrained, induced to make choices. James describes it this way in chapter 1, verse 14. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own, what? Desires. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And what does he do with that desire, that temptation, that enticement? The sinner, the one who is dead in trespasses and sins, chooses to sin. Not all the time. Occasionally a sinner may, that's wrong, I can't do that. But the sinner sins because he is by nature a sinner. Each one is tempted when he's drawn away and enticed by his own desires. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Remember Eve in the garden, right? Eve saw that the tree was good for food. She saw that it was pleasant to the eyes and what? Desirable to make one wise and so she took of the fruit of it uh, took of the fruit and ate and she gave to her husband and he ate Jonathan Edwards in his treatise on the freedom of the will he said this three moral agents always act according to the strongest inclination they have at the moment of choice that's a powerful statement but a true statement let that sink in for a moment Free moral agents always act according to the strongest inclination they have at the moment of choice. For the example before of uh, walking down the road, got your wallet in your back pocket, and somebody comes up to you, pulls his gun out, points his gun at you, and your wallet or your life. Your wallet or your life. Well, you don't desire to lose your wallet but you desire less to lose your life, he could just shoot you, take your life and your wallet. (laughs) So what do you do? You give him your wallet. You're being coerced to make a choice. You're being coerced to do something that you don't want to do, but that's a choice you're making because the strongest inclination at that moment, the strongest desire that you have is to save your own life, right? Save your own skin. So you give him your wallet. We don't make choices in a vacuum. We make choices based upon influences, conditions, inducements. Our will, in that sense, is not free. (laughs) When you sin, when you sin against God, your strongest inclination at that moment, your strongest desire is to sin. Now that is shameful, is it not? Anyone who's in Christ, that grieves your heart breaks your heart. When we sin, we don't sin in a vacuum. When we sin, it's because that's the strongest inclination of our heart in that moment is to desire that sin more than Jesus Christ. Desire that sin more than him, more than pleasing him. If your strongest inclination at that moment was to honor the Lord Jesus Christ, if your strongest inclination at that moment was to love him, then you would not sin against him. You would not obey that lust, you would obey the Lord Jesus Christ. In that sense, our will is not free. It is constrained, restrained, compelled, coerced, motivated, driven, induced by desire. That's what Paul is essentially saying there in verse 2, verse 3. Do you see? Notice in Ephesians chapter 2 that Paul doesn't stop there. Paul doesn't stop there. Being dead in sin means that our outward 
external conduct is sinful. The free choices that we make are sinful. But then Paul makes an incision. He cuts beneath the surface with his scalpel here, the scalpel of God's word, and he finds that we desire sin. Outward conduct then, we cut a little deeper. We realize that that conduct is based upon desire. Being dead in sin means that the desires of my flesh and the desires of my mind are sinful, not just my conduct. But then notice that Paul cuts even deeper in verse 3. He cuts even deeper in verse 3. And we were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Again, think with me. Our sinful conduct is the fruit of our sinful desire. Our sinful desire is the fruit of our sinful nature. We just keep going deeper, don't we? Peeling back the layers of the onion. I make free choices. I am a free moral agent. I am morally responsible for the choices that I make. But is my will really free? Is my will really free? No. No. It's not that at the fall we lost the ability to choose. That's how some people caricature the biblical view. We don't make any choices at all. We're just robots. We're mindless, heartless slaves of God. Everything's determined, and we're just puppets on a string. No, that's ignorant and foolish. Stop saying that. <laughs> Let's have an intelligent, biblically informed conversation here. It's not that at the fall we lost the ability to choose. The problem arising from the fall is that the basis from which we choose is entirely corrupt. We didn't lose the ability to choose, but the basis on which we choose the foundation on which we choose is entirely corrupt. A corrupt nature producing corrupt desires leading to corrupt choices eventuating in corrupt conduct. Do you see? We are free to make choices, but our will is not free. Because sin is the very excrement of our nature, and because we can do nothing to change our own nature, and because death is the recompense due the sinner, living even now with a stench of death clinging to them, Paul describes fallen man as dead in trespasses and sins. That's why we're called dead. That's why the scripture describes man as unable to do God. You see, not just our conduct, not just our free choices, it, it dives deeper into our desires and even yet deeper into our very nature. Sin has permeated the entirety of our being. Its corruption has influenced all of our faculties. Man, in that sense, is totally depraved. That's what total depravity, the doctrine of total depravity, teaches. We are dead in trespasses and sins. The Bible describes man as unable to do good, and as good, the Bible means good as the Bible itself describes or understands or reveals good. It is righteous, holy. Those actions that are holy done in faith. When the rich young ruler approached the Lord Jesus Christ, he called him good, didn't he? In Luke 18, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The Lord Jesus Christ, understanding that the rich young ruler was coming to him, seeing him as just a man, just a rabbi, just a teacher, he says to him, why do you call me good? There is one good, your Father in heaven. In other words, there are no men on earth who are good, as the Bible would describe it, right? Except the Bible's diagnosis of our condition. There are none who are good. We are all corrupt by sin, it permeates every part of you. We are dead in trespasses and sins. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. The fallen men often do 
things, good works, that are good in the worldly definition of what is good, good by worldly standards. But those works that may be good by worldly standards are corrupt and polluted in God's sight. He doesn't see those works as done as good because they're not done by faith in His Son. They're not done through the power of His Spirit. They're not done for His glory. They're not good in that sense. How does the Bible describe men? Every intent of the thoughts of his heart are only evil continually. The 1689, again, chapter 9, article 3. Man, by his fall into a state of sin, hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good. Accompanying salvation. You see what they're saying. Because of his fall into a state of sin, he's lost the ability to do any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin, he is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. In other words, his will is not free. His will is not free. Romans chapter 8, verse 7 because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. It speaks of inability. Man is unable to subject himself to the law of God. John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Speaks of inability. No one can. Whosoever comes, no one can. No one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. John chapter 6, verse 65. John chapter 8, verse 43. The Lord in an encounter with the Pharisees. Why do you not understand my speech? Because, he says to them, you are not able to listen to my word. You don't have the ability. You can't. Do it. It's not been granted to you. It's not been given. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. Why? Because they have the same nature as their father. They have the same nature as their father. You're of your father the devil, the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, right? Speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of it. But because the Lord says, I tell you the truth, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. It's not that you do not believe me when I tell you the truth. No, because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me, the Lord says. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. We need, desperately need, a radical transformation of our very nature, of who we are. We need to be transformed. John Calvin said this, If we mean by free, or if we mean by free will, that fallen man has the ability to choose what he wants, well then of course fallen man has free will. If we mean by that term that man in his fallen state has the moral power and ability to choose righteousness, then free will is far too grandiose a term to apply to fallen man. These are the effects of the fall on the will of man. Man is a free moral and responsible agent, but man's will is anything, anything but free. He's lost the freedom to be good. He's lost the freedom to do good. He's now in bondage to sin, enslaved to sin, because he is a sinner by nature, by nature nature, a child of wrath, just as the others, that nature producing sinful desires, those sinful desires eventuating in sinful conduct. Our will is shackled 
by our influences. Our will is shackled by our desires. Our will is shackled by our very nature. Our will is not free, do you see? The Lord himself states this principle. Matthew chapter 7, verse 18, listen. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. What is he talking about? He's getting down to the very nature of the tree. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. And listen, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What is the characteristic fruit of your heart? What is the characteristic fruit of your mind? What are you marked by? If we made an incision, (laughs) we uncovered the desires of your heart, the desires of your mind, the lusts of your flesh, What characterizes you? Is it a lust for those things that gratify gratify the flesh? Is it a lust to walk after the course of this world, the things of the world, the things in the world, the people of the world? Is your heart, is your mind given over to sinful passions, sinful desires, Other than showing up here on a Sunday morning, what is it about your quote-unquote Christian life that makes you look any different than the world? Are you given to anger? This doesn't mean that the Christian doesn't get angry. Are you given to it? Is that just natural to you, to be angry, to get angry, to, to, to live in anger? Are you bitter? Are you given over to resentment? Do you fail to forgive? Do you just hold a grudge? It's a part of your nature to hold on to that thing. Are you given over to uncleanness? Sexual immorality. You may come here and play the part, but you go home and in the privacy, your own thoughts, in the privacy of your own room, you live like a devil. You need a fundamental change in nature. You need a fundamental change in who you are, how you think. You need a change in the things that you desire. You need a new heart. That comes through the gospel. That comes through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ applied by the Spirit to your heart, your mind, You need a fundamental change in nature. In order for a sinner to make a free choice to turn from sin and put his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he must have an earnest desire to do so. It's not just he has to have his intellect persuaded to come down an aisle and say a prayer, asking Jesus into his heart. It doesn't mean that We just merely need to change his mind. I think that these things are right, and so that's what I'll decide to do. No, no, no. No, no. He needs a change of his nature. He needs a change of his heart. He must have an earnest desire to follow Christ, an earnest disgust with himself, an earnest love and affection for who Christ is and what Jesus Christ has done for sinners. In order for there to be an earnest desire, the Lord must must make us alive in Christ. In order for that desire to be there, the Lord must make us alive in Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, down in verse 4. This view of free will is compatible with God's sovereignty. Do you see? God, in grace, determines our salvation and carries it out. He must do that, otherwise no one would be saved. Do you see? We need the desire. Who gives us those good desires? God does by transforming us, right? Look at verse four. But God, I love the buts in the Bible. 
But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. Notice who is working here. It's God. God is working. It's not man making a choice. Who's making the choice? God is. God is the one who's determined, right? God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. Now there's a before that Paul just got done teaching us about in verses 1 through 3. When we were dead in our sin, that's the before. Now there's an after, isn't there? When we were given new life in Christ, we were that. Now in Christ, we are this. He's saying something fundamental, isn't he, about our very nature, about who we are. He's saying something fundamental, foundational about our nature. We were dead, now we're alive. If Mrs. Potts were a theologian, she'd be singing, there's something there that wasn't there before, right? <laughs> I've got kids. <laughs> I'm terrible at illustrations, and those are the illustrations that come to mind. So, <laughs> But what is it that wasn't there before? It's regeneration. It's new life. It's new life. A new nature. It's a new heart. We've been transformed. Radical transformation. Not just in our conduct. That's moralism. Formalism. Legalism. Anybody can just clean up the outside of the cup. We need cleansing on the inside. We need our hearts transformed. What is this talking about? It's talking about that. Not just a cleansing up, a cleaning up of our conduct. It's not sim just as simple as saying, well, just desire that. Listen, I love lasagna. I hate cabbage. Like boiled cabbage is the worst. I can't just go from lo to, to loving. It would take a radical transformation, something miraculous for me to love boiled cabbage the way that I love lasagna. We need a radical transformation, a change in our, it's not just a matter of changing desire. We need a change of who we are. That's what happens in the gospel. The Lord changes who we are fundamentally, foundationally. It's a new heart, a new nature, new will, new desires. These are the effects of conversion on fallen man. You see, these are the effects of conversion, of regeneration of the new birth. Think with me. The Lord said that as a part of the new covenant, the covenant of grace. So we're talking about the covenant of grace is the new covenant. In Ezekiel 36, the Lord said, I will cleanse you. Listen to what the Lord said. This is salvation. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness, he later says, right? I'll deliver you from all your filth. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. That's what the Lord says he will do when he causes someone to be born again, when he saves them. Instead of a heart of stone, hard, insensitive, right, you stiff-necked people, all day long, I've held out my arm to an, a stiff-necked people, the Lord says, because they're hard-hearted. They're hard-hearted, insensitive. Past any spiritual feeling. And he takes that heart of stone out of the person, so to speak, figuratively here, and gives them a heart of flesh, a heart of flesh, soft, tender, able, willing to overflow with affection for the one who is most worthy of our affections. One who sees the Lord Jesus Christ as supremely precious, right? He who is ordered wrong becomes ordered aright. This is the new creation. Behold, we are made a new creation. There's nothing less here than a renovation of man's very nature. Peter says we become partakers of the divine nature. We become partakers of the divine nature. That renovation of our nature leads to new desires. If you say to me, listen, I'm a Christian, but my desires have never been changed. You're not a Christian. You're not a Christian. If you don't have a new relationship with your sin, where you learn to despise, you hate that sin that you once enjoyed when you love the one who you once hated. The renovation of our nature leads to new desires, new affections, new motivations, new inducements, new convictions. And those new desires inexorably, inevitably lead to new conduct, to turning from sin. In other words, it's back up the ladder, so to speak, right? We're going back up from nature 
to desires, and then to conduct. And that, that renovated heart, that nature that the Spirit of God works in, remember past that in Ezekiel 36, the determinism that the Lord then speaks with. He says in Ezekiel 36, then what does he say? I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Sounds very deterministic, doesn't it? The Lord is at work in us. The Lord is at work in that new heart with those new desires by his spirit to cause us to treasure him, to obey his word. In other words, in conversion, our will is gloriously set free then from its bondage to sin. Our will is liberated. And now we can choose righteousness. We can choose that which is pleasing to him where we could not before. Right? Our nature has been changed. We've been transformed. So our will is free then. <laughs> it's free. No. <laughs> and I, for one, am exceedingly grateful to God that it is not. Why is it not free? Because now I hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want to be pleasing to him. I want to serve him, heart, soul, mind, and strength. I, I desire to follow hard after him. I desire to worship him in the way that he is worthy to be worshiped. I want to live with him. Right as Paul in Romans 7, the very things that I want to do, these are the things that I don't do as I should. The things that I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it's holy, just, and good. I agree in my mind, but then I find this other principle in my members and I end up doing the very things that I don't want to do. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 22, now having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God. But praise God, right? Praise God, praise God. Having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, what? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we continue in Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 6. He raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We just think for a moment how the Bible talks about these things and describes these things. Can you see how utterly ridiculously, how deplorably foolish it is to think that we could ever earn salvation by our works? What a stupid thought that is, right? How, who we are by nature and what we do by nature, that we could ever merit salvation? Listen, that we could just saunter down an aisle and make a choice whenever we want to. You know those that'll say, oh, listen, I'm just going to send it up until I'm on my deathbed, and when I'm on my deathbed, I'm going to... You fool, you fool, you fool. By grace you have been saved. Through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are His workmanship. Do you see? Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Man wants to take all of that and make it the fruit of his own free will. Wants to take all of that and make it the fruit of a decision. Listen, our decision is the fruit of all of that. <laughs> Do you see the difference? Luther said, man's hope is not in the freedom of man's choice, 
but in the freedom of God's grace. <laughs> Praise God. Now let me ask you the question. If you're in Christ today, did you choose to follow Christ? Of course you did. Of course you did. Why? Because the Lord caused you to be born again. He gave you a new heart and you believed. He does this, by the way, through the preaching of the gospel. God does that through the preaching of the gospel. Then, then you made a decision to listen and consider and you made a decision to turn from your sin and to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You decided. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how will they call upon him of whom they have not believed, in whom they've not believed? How will they call on him in whom they've not believed? How will they believe in him of whom they've not heard? We hear, we believe, we call, but you see the sovereignty of God behind it all, right? The Lord sovereignly working behind it all. Think about Lydia. In Acts chapter 16, verse 14, listen to this in verse 14 about Lydia. A certain woman named Lydia heard us, heard the preaching of Paul. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. You notice the flow of the events there, right? Paul preached, she listened. The Lord opened her heart, and she believed. Do you see? So many examples of this in the Bible. So many examples in the Bible. In the 1689 again, chapter 9, article 4, speaking here of the effects of conversion, listen. When God converts a sinner and translates him into the state of grace, he freeth him from his natural bondage under sin and by his grace alone enables him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good. Yet so as that by reason of his remaining corruptions, he doth not perfectly nor only will that which is good, but doth also that which is evil. Brings up an important point in Article 4 there. On this side of eternity, we're being sanctified. We need sanctification. A sanctification is monergistic. It's a work of God, but we work in it, don't we? We work in it. God determines every step. And again, we're back to that elemental truth from the Bible. Every choice that we make is free, and every choice that we make is determined. Listen to this from Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Biblical compatibilism explains that every action that we take has a two-part explanation. There's a concurrence. There's a confluence of a work. One divine and one human. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Man desires, man thinks, man plans, man acts. And yet the Lord is above all of that, directing each step along the path of a perfect plan that he has decreed from before the foundation of the world. And he does so without violence to our will. He does so without undermining our free choices and he does so in a way that upholds our moral responsibility for the choices that we make. We studied that with the sermon on providence several weeks ago. I refer those sermons to you. So he's considered the effects of the fall, the effects of conversion. What about the effects of glorification? <laughs> what do we have to look forward to? Article 5 in our statement of faith says it this way. This will of man is made perfectly and immutably free to good alone in the state of glory only. You, don't want to, you want to know uh, when free will really takes place. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Glorification. Our will is free. In a state of glory, we will be immutably free to do all good. 
If you're lost here this morning, if you have not experienced a work of grace in your heart, if you can sit here this morning and you know, you know that God has not wrought a change within you, that he's not changed your nature, that you still are enslaved to the desires of your flesh, walking after the course of this world, by nature a child of wrath, a spirit that works in the sons of disobedience, working yet in you. But what about responding to the gospel? The Lord works through means. As he has appointed the ends, so he has appointed the means. And the Lord works through the preaching of the gospel. You're here today. You've had opportunity to hear. How will you respond? You can pray. You can read. You can attend. You can cry out to God for mercy. You can cry out to the Lord that he would do a work in you to transform your heart, to take out that heart of stone and to give you a heart of flesh. And he calls you to repent. He calls you to turn from your sin. He calls you to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Pray that the Lord would change you. Turn from your sin and trust in him. It's a matter of faith, isn't it? Turn from your sin and trust in him. Brothers and sisters, we've been given great blessings in Christ. Great blessings. Let us live for the Lord Jesus Christ in light of those blessings. It is God who works in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Let's worship. Let's pray. Let's serve. Let's obey. Let's love right, as God would call us to. For his everlasting praise and glory. Amen. All praise, honor, and glory to the one who has saved us. Let's take a few moments now and pray. I want you to pray silently and do business before God. Consider what God has done in the gospel. Uh, consider what you would ask him to do now during this time. If you're lost, for salvation. If you're saved, to preserve you, to sanctify you, to prepare you for glory. When we're done praying, we'll pray together and then you'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Father, I pray now for, for sinners to be converted to Christ. And I pray, Lord, for your people to be built up in their faith, that we would, in the strength that you supply by your Spirit, serve you acceptably with fear while we sojourn here on this side of eternity, that we would rely on you and labor and strive working out our own salvation knowing that it is you who works in us to will and to do according to your good pleasure help us lord to persevere in faith and holiness growing in our knowledge of you in wisdom and in maturity and faith and help us lord to fervently serve you fervently, earnestly obey you, to live for you, Lord, to be worthy, to walk worthy of the calling with which we are called for your everlasting praise and glory. May you be magnified in these things and thank you for this blessed privilege, Lord, of studying your word together and what it says on subjects like this. Help us to think rightly, knowing, Lord, that the way that we think influences the way that we live and conform us into the image of your Son. Renew our minds after your holy word. And help us, Lord, to live more fervently for you, devotedly for you, affectionately for you. We pray all these things in the blessed name of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.